give a brief introduction. Uh, it is really my honor and pleasure to introduce uh, an esteemed and long, long uh, time uh, colleague and friend, uh, Dr. Marek Nellis, um, to give our grand round lecture today. Uh, Dr. Nellis uh, has been um, practicing critical care for over 25 years. Um, he's a truly multinational practitioner. Uh, between his education and, uh, and practice, uh, you, will, uh, you will see how uh, diverse he is. Um, Dr. Nellis currently is the director of the intensive care unit at uh, Goldburn Hospital, um, which is in uh, um, North South Wales, Australia, as well as a senior consultant in, uh, in the ICU at Liverpool Hospital, that's also in Sydney. Uh, he graduated and trained from Charles University in Bills in Czech Republic, my hometown, uh, before moving to Australia in 2002. He also, after training in anesthesia critical care, um, he did a fellowship in uh, Yopio University in Finland, as well as University of Ulm in Germany. Um, Dr. Uh, Nalus uh, holds a PhD and a social professorship in critical care. He is uh, on faculty, not only where he's practicing now in um, in, uh, in in Charles, uh, in, uh, in Australia. He is uh, also uh, a social professor in uh, um, of, of medicine in Charles University uh, at Czech Republic as well as a social professor in, Austra in Australian National University. Again, that's part of Goldburn uh, Clinical School. His interest uh, has been uh, in uh, critical care echocardiography, where he, he taught so many uh, lectures and symposium and workshop, lung ultrasound, telehealth, um, and sepsis, immune function, metabolism in critical care, uh, nutrition as well. He co-authored over, um, over 60 articles in peer-reviewed journal. He had uh, earned multiple teaching awards. Um, he uh, is really a multi-talented and uh, faceted, experienced uh, intensivist, and it's been a pleasure to have him today to give uh, our grand round talk on lactate and critical illness, what's new. And he warned us by saying, I will be controversial. So <laughs> we'll, uh, we'll see how controversial it's going to be. Uh, welcome, Marek, and uh, thank you for, uh, for doing this for us. And thank you, Adel and um, uh, Rupa, for inviting me to present at your grand round. It's a great honor, and I'm really happy to do it. I would be much nicer to do it in person, but unfortunately, that, uh, uh, that was not possible. But I'm uh, more than happy to do it uh, online. And I hope sometime we, we meet in person again and I'll be able to visit your excellent hospital too. So lactate and criticalness, what's new? So when, um, and I have to do this. Okay, so when I was at medical school in Pilsen, uh, and you probably may, may have been taught the same, we're taught that lactate is a dead end waste product of anaerobic glycolysis. It's a cause of oxygen death. That's a cause of muscle fatigue. And it's a factor in acidosis induced tissue damage and is a cause of circulatory compromise. And um, it's a marker of poor prognosis. Sorry, there's a dog in the room that I have to leave out. <laughs> Otherwise, he will cry and you will hear it. I'm sorry. I forgot to mention okay, that right. Dr. Marek <laughs> my friend he's now yeah. giving the talk from, uh, from France. Okay, so as you were taught, you know, there's a glucose and there's oxygen combined and then uh, they, uh, there's process of glycolysis and if there's oxygen, there's aerobic respiration in the mitochondria and you have carbon dioxide and water produced. And uh, if it doesn't, you know, if there's no oxygen, it's anaerobic and anaerobic is bad. And when we think the, the patient has got anaerobic metabolism because the lactate is high, we give the patient some fluid. And uh, this is just a, a little controversy. We give lactated fluid sometimes, a ring of lactate, but you know, uh, saline and whatever, we treat it with fluid. 
but is that really um, what needs to be done? We also, you know, even even ten years ago um, in JAMA, uh, your colleagues in uh, from states published a paper on lactate clearance versus central venous oxygen saturation, and they stating that circulatory shock is caused because of inadequate oxygen delivery, and that results in mitochondrial hypoxia, and that's the cause for elevated lactate. And then mitochondrial oxidation fails, that's uh, increasing lactate. And uh, in patients in sepsis, the blood lactate concentrations varies uh, in proportion to the ongoing deficit in tissue oxygenation, and that the ability to reduce blood lactate concentration indicates restoration of oxygen delivery uh, during resuscitation. So. It's not exactly quite like what it is, uh, what's really happening. So this would be the, the bit of controversy. So my objective is to tell you that lactate is actually not a harmful product of anaerobic metabolism at all. It's a normal, usual part of our intermediate metabolism. I also will tell you that hyperlactatemia and acidosis are correlated, but it's a correlation. There's no cause effect relationship. And I will, in the last part of my talk, say about something about intravenous fluid therapy that I don't think should be actually guided by lactate clearance. Um, so I will say, though, to, you know, so to, to, to be perfectly um, on the topic is that lactate is actually a marker of poor prognosis. And we know that when lactate is high, it's not good for the patients. Their mortality is really increasing. Odds of dying are more than 10 if the lactate is uh, between 15 and 20 or over 20 millimoles per liter. And uh, so it's associated with mortality. It's also associated with organ dysfunction. And patients who are not able to reduce their lactate die more often. And patients who are unable to clear lactate um, uh, they receive more vasopressors, they are sicker, so it correlates with severity. Uh, but what it indicates is there is actually something wrong in the with the patient and not necessarily with the oxygen. So let's start with glucose paradox. I'm not sure whether you know about this glucose paradox, but what happens there is actually when we eat, and that's actually the study they used, they gave uh, volunteers omelette, uh, your breakfast meal, and uh, they measured the plasma glucose and lactate and free fatty acids and insulin glucagon. And they demonstrated what happens when you eat meal, which is abandoned glucose. Most of the glucose doesn't get into your liver and to form glycogen. Most of the glucose is actually bypassing the liver and is going to the peripheral tissues. And in the peripheral tissues, some of it is utilized in mitochondria and that's oxidative and some of it goes just through glycolysis to produce lactate. The lactate is then taken up back into the venous system and goes then to the liver and goes then to kidney um, and muscle to form glycogen. And uh, you can see that when the plasma glucose increases, that the plasma lactate rises straight after. Um, and you, our bodies can actually use one third goes through this non-oxidative to two thirds can go into through the non-oxidative pathway, uh, depending on what we're doing. Um, so that's called glucose paradox. Most of the glucose doesn't go straight to the liver, goes to the peripheral tissues, gets turned into lactate, and then uh, then serves for gluconeogenesis later on. So. During normal day, there is actually quite a high lactate turnover in our body. And the turnover on a molar basis is almost similar to, to glucose, slightly less in postprandial stay. Uh, and about 150 gram of a day of lactate is produced. And there's big exchange between different organs. And if you if you give patients, or in this in this uh, paper, it was actually experimental. Uh, you give uh, volunteers a, a labeled uh, substance, labeled glucose and labeled lactate. Here you can see that both glucose and lactate can actually enter the uh, Krebs cycle, the TCA cycle, 
uh, to then produce molecules that will lead to uh, formation of uh, protein gradient across the mitochondrial uh, ATP synthase. And this is an elegant study that also demonstrated a similar thing is that in, in pigs, they, um, they measured diff 14 different, sorry, 11 different uh, organ beds, and they measured the arterial um, and concentration of a metabolite and the metabolite in the venous blood. And then also they used data from a uh, mice model where they infused the mice with, um, with uh, traces, radioisotopes, to measure inter-organ exchange of different substances, different metabolites. And what they were able to demonstrate is that, as you can see in the, in the picture, is that glucose is mainly consumed by the peripheral organs. And there is two organs that produce it by gluconeogenesis, is mainly liver and, and kidney. And uh, for lactate, it's not quite so. Lactate is a universal uh, metabolites that some most organs can produce or release depending on what they're doing, depending on what they need, what they what the need of the organism or the organ is. And they were able also to demonstrate that the actual flux, total flux, how much lactate gets into circulation, uh, is much higher than for glucose in a post-absorptive state, and that is we don't usually appreciate it by measuring a T and venous concentration because we cannot see how much exchange of lactate there is within an organ. So if you have a muscle, the muscle will consume glucose, produce lactate, but other cells in, that, in the same muscle will use that lactate to use it for energy, uh, to, to uh, burn it in Krebs cycle to produce uh, ATP, CO2 and water. So lactate has higher total flux in and out of circulation. And the exchange between organs is less than is the overall flux because of the, this intra-organ metabolism of lactate. But it serves as a universal carbohydrate because as you know, lactate is three carbons, glucose is six carbons. So it's like a half a glucose that's freely available everywhere in the body, wherever it's needed. And so the body can easily distribute the, the fuel around. And you also don't need to phosphorylate lactate to get into cells, whereas you have to do it for glucose. You have to have transporter, uh, GLUT1, and you'll then have to phosphorylate the glucose to trap it in the cell. But for lactate, it just goes in and can, can come out without any need for phosphorylation, so using energy. And this was demonstrated that this is happening in our patients. And in our patients, in fact, this it demonstrates how important this mechanism is. So this is a study also from the States, from California. And this is patients with traumatic brain injury. And you can see that this is first week after traumatic brain injury. You see the arterial lactate is actually, in mean one, is lower in patients than in control healthy people. So the level is normal. But... Uh, the production of lactate in trauma, a traumatic brain injury patient is increased by 70%. And brain, the, the body increases the production of lactate to support the energy need of the brain and of the organs that, that uh, under, you know, during inflammatory response syndrome. And they also demonstrate about half of the energy provision for injured brain came from lactate. 10% directly because brain can actually utilize lactate and about 40% indirectly from uh, glucose that's derived from lactate via gluconeogenesis through the glucose paradox, a mechanism that we were talking initially. So when we look at lactate, this is what we see. We see the bottom of uh, a beautiful airplane, but we don't see the lactate shuttle that the airplane carries. And that's because the rate of appearance or the production of lactate and the rate of disposal or the metabolism of lactate are usually in, in equilibrium. And so we only see the eleva you know, elevation when there's either increased production or reduced disposal, but we don't see the inter-organ exchange or intra-organ exchange. And I will just try to talk about how important it is, for example, in exercise. So when we exercise, the overall turnover of lactate is actually much higher, almost double that of glucose on a molar basis. 
and it's about 700 gram a day. So that's a lot if you were exercising for that long. But let's just talk about how muscle, when you when you need to sprint for your life uh, because you endanger it, you need energy now, ATP now, and you need a lot of it. And you can do it by taking the phosphate from phosphocreatine uh, to, to phosphorylate ADP and create ATP quickly. That's a very quick mechanism. You also can turn on glycolysis, which I will talk about it later, is turned on by your uh, adrenaline, by your adrenergic stress system. When you need to run, you have this adrenergic release. And so glycolysis is turned on. And as the glycolysis is turned on, slowly the oxidative phosphorylate goes, goes up. And this is what happens in a maximum sprint exercise during 30 seconds in this study. And the re one of the reasons for that is, is that cells, um, they need ATP. They cannot, we cannot transfer ATP from one cell to the other, but we can transfer um, other substances as we were talk as we'll talk about. But when you turn on the, the glycolysis, the product, which is ADP, function as a, a turbo mechanism, stimulates uh, the oxidative phosphorylation, stimulates the pyrite dehydrogenase. Um, and so the glycolysis not only provides the immediate ADP, uh, but provides, um, provides uh, also a stimulus for the oxidative phosphorylation, which is much more effective in terms of amount of ATP produced. Uh, it it, it uh, turns it on. So the glycolytic ATP functions as a turbo mechanism. And of course, it does produce lactate. And the lactate is then exchanged with the other cells in the body. Um, and, and the overall equilibrium is maintained. So this is another study which actually looked, it's quite an interesting study that looked at two or three bouts of, of exercise, but we talk about only about the first one and the last one, the bout one and bout three of exercise that are um, and in between there is rest, but it's a maximum, super maximum exercise, power output two to three times VO max, uh, VO2 max. And of course, lactate accumulation with the, occurs with the glycolytic bout. Um, uh, and you can see the one where I put the red lines is that the, the lactate uh, increases during the first bout, but as the oxidative phosphorylate uh, gets activated, it gets activated to a maximum degree during the third bout of exercise. And you can see that now the lactate is no longer increasing. Why? Because it's now burned in the uh, Krebs cycle and in the oxidative phosphorylase um, as an energy. And so um, the oxidative phosphorylation can deal with most of the lactate and what it doesn't deal with, it can excrete. And the other interesting point is that the power uh, that the muscle can elicit during the bout of exercise, the power is the highest during the first bout. Even though we have more efficient energy use in the third bout of exercise, the power cannot be at as high. It's not achievable. And so the, the lactate, the stress, the initial reaction that we have to give to, to, to survive, to run away from the danger or to fight, that gives us the, the most of the um, power. It uses the energy and uses glycolysis and lactates produced during the process to give us the ability. What was also interesting is acidosis, on the other hand, was more severe during the third bout of exercise than during the first bout, despite that there was lactate accumulation. So there was a disconnect between lactate and acidosis. And we shouldn't be surprised when we look at the lactate and acidosis, we look at the LDH reaction, which is the reaction pyruvate to lactate, which used to be the, called the dead end of glycolysis. You can actually see that... Uh, Pyruvate attracts a proton. So in fact, lactate is consuming a proton, acts as an intracellular base, as a proton buffer in the cell. So it allows the flow of glycolysis and it then can be exported. And one of my friends and colleagues in, who's uh, used to be in New Mexico is now in Australia as well. He did something that uh, has been published and is called a quantitative proton exchange 
by competitive cation binding, and he, he is able on his computer to calculate this, this binding of proton to all the molecules uh, in the glycolytic process during exercise, and he modeled it on the exercise. And uh, what he was able to show that um, the most acidifying process in the glycolysis, the anaerobic glycolysis, which happens whether there's oxygen or not, is actually the glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate dehydrogenase reaction, which releases most of the proton. And ATP also that's used um, during the glycolysis, but also during exercise, is the um, they are the reactions that release proton, whereas lactate uh, production actually attracts proton. Uh, and you can see it's, um, it's about um, 44 plus. So it sort of attracts quite a lot of proton. So it's acts like an intracell proton. The other interesting and important point is that the proton release is about four times what is actually a lactate production on a molar basis. So there's four times more protons produced uh, during glycolysis than, um, than actually lactate produced. So how come when we measure lactate in the blood, in an ATU blood gas or venous blood gas, how come it correlates with the anion gap and so on? Uh, one of the reasons is that the cells, when they exercise, the acidosis is, is not very good for the environment in the cell. So the cells have to remove the proton out and they do it by uh, proton transporters. And a, a large part of the uh, proton transport, not all of it, but some, time, some part of it, is through uh, carbonic anhydrase that's connected with, with a more, uh, an enzyme system that's called uh, monocarboxylate transporter that transport lactate, anionic molecule, out of the cell together with the proton that's in the cell. So what gets out may be called lactic acid, which is technically also not correct, as we will uh, show in the next slide. But that's how the lactate and proton go out on a molar basis. And we might skip this one. Um, but uh, you can see that when the, when the lactate gets out of the cell, it is in a pH that's always greater than 6, because we can't really survive pH less than 6.5. I haven't seen anything less than 6.5. 6.58 I have seen, yes. But when you look at the, uh, the dissociation constant or lactic acid in, in, uh, in blood, most of it is dissociated. 99.9% .9 is dissociated. So is it lactate and iron? There's no lactic acid in the blood. And we'll go back to two slides. And uh, this... this um, Get lactate getting out along with the proton actually enables to keep a redox balance between different cells. Because remember, we're talking about the shuttle going around the body and the lactate being used wherever it needs to be used. And some even speculate that the lactate going into the cells dictates the rate of glycolysis and dictates the rate of NADH and NAD formation in different cells. But essentially, it's like, a, it's like a buffer between acidotic cells in the muscle that's exercising or in the organ that's under stress. And then it goes somewhere else where it can be used. The lactate can go into the cells and be burned. And during the process, actually, the proton is, is um, consumed. And so there's the redox balance is kept within the organism. Uh, and you can see it as, as here as well. And as you can see, what the orders of this uh, beautiful review say is that the lactate essentially decouples glycolysis from the Krebs cycle on a cellular level, but of course, on the whole body level, it has to be balanced. Now, we talked about the lactate and acidosis, and, and I told you that it's correlated, but it's not actually cause-effect relationship, that there's some excretion of protein and lactate together out of cells. Uh, and that may be one of the reasons why these orders were not able to show a great correlation on the, between lactate level and unmeasured or degree of acidosis as assessed by unmeasured anions or anion gap or albumin-corrected anion gap uh, in patients. 
And not surprisingly, we have done a study where we've infused lactate to volunteers and also to patients in, in uh, cardiogenic shock. Uh, it's a half molar lactate. It's quite a lot of lactate that we infuse, a short infusion because it's hyper or smaller. Uh, and you can see that, um, that although lactate rises, the pH of these patients rises. And yes, we infuse lac sodium lactate, but again, it just demonstrated that when the lactate is metabolized in in cells in the body, the pH actually goes up. So why do we have lactic acidosis and what, what's causing increased lactate production uh, in our patients? Well, I will tell you that type A tissue hyperperfusion and poor systemic oxygenation is relatively uncommon. More common is actually the, the beta adrenergic stimulation, and also the fact that when we have uh, activated inflammatory uh, system, uh, leukocytes, enterocytes, uh, or if you have a cancer, the proliferating, rapidly proliferating cells uh, actually produce a lot of lactate by a mechanism called the Warburg, Warburg effect, something that Otto Warburg got Nobel Prize in 1924, where he noticed that cancer cells actually produce a lot of lactate when there's a lot of oxygen around. And of course, time in deficiency in toxins, mitochondrial toxins, will cause um, glycoly glycolytic production. And the lactate, because mitochondria everywhere are poisoned, cannot be metabolized elsewhere. The shuttle cannot be functional because other cells are unable to use it. So, you know, our patients often get quite a lot of exercise. They get quite agitated in the emergency department or even in the ICU. So their lactate, of course, goes up with that, with their exercise. And the adrenergic stress is a very known mechanism because the beta receptors is connected to a sodium potassium pump in, in, in the membrane. They have close uh, spatial connection and the potassium, sodium potassium pump, ATP pump is uh, connected to glycolysis. And we know that the sodium potassium pump uses uh, a lot of energy in our body. In fact, about half to three uh, to two thirds of our energy is used by this pump. And uh, Bruno Levy, uh, France, and he's actually in Paris, has demonstrated quite nicely that when you block by obeying the sodium potassium pump, that, uh, that you can actually reduce hyperlactatemia in critically ill patients, in patients with septic shock. And he also demonstrated quite nicely that the, the muscle PO2 uh, hasn't changed or anything that's got anything to do with oxygen. Uh, availability for mitochondria. So it's the, the beta agonist uh, stimulated sodium potassium pump uh, function uh, that, um, that actually drives the glycolytic lactate production and it can be abolished by infusing obeying. We can also we also know that if you infuse your patients with adrenaline, uh, your lactate will rise. And this was a uh, study in Australia when I was working in North Shore. It was uh, North Shore Hospital in Sydney. Uh, we were part of this study, and you can see that if you give noradrenaline or adrenaline on a blinded basis, uh, the outcomes were not different. Blood pressure was not different, but the lactate level was different before because epinephrine leads to stimulation of the sodium potassium pump and glycolytic lactate production. Uh, and you can also see that uh, pay, you know, patient, almost 13% of patients uh, were withdrawn from the study by attending clinicians because clinicians were worried about the hyperlactatemia. Uh, they thought patients got lactic acid or must be getting worse, but in fact, it's just uh, you know, it's an epiphenomenon. So, uh, the other source of lactate is rapidly proliferating cells, as I said, the Warburg effect. And if you activate white cells by endotoxin volunteers, up to 50% of blood lactate production can come from this uh, LPS-induced leukocyte activation. Your T cells uh, activate glycolysis and different cells uh, in the immune repertoire uh, proportion activate glycolysis if they have need to grow, to proliferate, to form membranes. And all of that is, uh, we could demonstrate in septic shock patients on a transcriptomic level. Uh, in, in septic shock patients uh, or sepsis SERS patients, you see that the enzymes here, and you can see that there's totally different pattern in controls. 
is the enzymes at the top are the enzymes of glycolysis. Uh, they are activated in the patients, they are blue, whereas the enzymes in the Krebs cycle uh, are reduced uh, on a transcriptional level in patients. And the reason for that is that on this uh, diagram is explained because we need glycolysis not only to, for the energy, we also need it uh, for the pentose phosphate pathway to provide one antioxidants, which are very important in stress situation, but also for biosynthetic needs for our nucleic acid uh, synthesis and for synthesis of biomembranes of lipids, which which go through TCA, but also part of the uh, part of them go through pentose phosphate pathway. So rapidly proliferating cells large need for building blocks for nucleic acids for membranes and also for antioxidant because they protect the cells from uh, the uh, the growth in you know you have a lot of production a lot of reactive oxygen species production in mitochondria that are also are working so they're not exclusive they work together uh, but um, the uh, the glycolysis is activated not just for energy needs but also for metabolic needs because they provide these antioxidants and because they provide the building blocks for membranes and nucleic acids. So the other thing that happens in critical illness is that we have decreased lactate disposal. We know that it takes us a bit longer to, to um, the lactate is elevated because it's produced by the adrenergic system, by the activated inflammatory cells. Maybe if you have a clear gut ischemia, uh, it will be produced because if you really don't have any oxygen, then of course you can't run your mitochondria. And then the lactate is going elsewhere. We showed that uh, we were discussing earlier that during glucose products, the, the lactate goes into the venous blood and is distributed to many organs. They, a lot of them take it, but mainly liver and main, mainly kidneys, the, the, um, uh, the splunkling organs. And they uh, receive normally quite a large proportion of cardiac output. And uh, my apologies here. And you know that when, uh, and I've, I've observed this when I did my fellowship in Germany, where this was experimental fellowship uh, with endotoxic shock in pigs. And you, when you infuse uh, pigs uh, with endotoxin, you monitor the blood pressure, nothing happens for about half an hour. You can't see any change in the blood pressure whatsoever. But what you can see and what we were able to observe, we had flow meters on the portal vein and on the hepatic artery. And you can see that the portal vein flow goes from one liter to 50 mils, 20 times less, while there's no change in blood pressure in the experimental animal. And that's because there's profound uh, vasoconstriction in the splunknic circulation to preserve blood pressure and circulation for the vital organs. And this was a study, uh, an old study, uh, and again in the States, in dogs, where they induce hemorrhage of 20 mils per kilo. And you can see the systemic blood pressure goes down a little bit, but the portal venous flow is really, really reduced in these animals. And you can see the same happening in trauma, and burn injury and sepsis, uh, portal venous flow, splunknic venous flow really is, is reduced dramatically. And so we don't have the delivery of the lactate uh, that the shuttle is bringing because it's the, the splunknic blood flow is so reduced. And that is probably the reasons why when you give, people say, oh, lactate is high, let's give fluid. Yes, if it's caused by hypovolemia, if we can restore some of the blood volume, then of course the vasoconstriction will be less and therefore you'll have more lactate going into the liver and kidney and therefore will be uh, metabolized. And of course that lactate will reduce. And we then think, okay, that has helped our patient. And some of them, yes, but not all of them. And you can see in the second part of the slide that uh, portal vein flow and, and hepatic artery blood flow is also reduced in patients with sepsis and septic shock. However, in cardiogenic shock, uh, Swiss colleagues many years ago in two, year 2000 
elegantly demonstrated that when you infuse labored lactate into patients in cardiogenic shock, these were patients after cardiac surgery on adrenaline, dobutamine, noradrenaline, you see their plasma level of lactate is high, is elevated uh, compared to volunteers. But they also metabolize lactate that's infused, the labored lactate that they infused, and there was quite a bit of lactate. And almost as quick, not as quick, but almost as quick as healthy volunteers. And the lactate is not only metabolized by gluconeogenesis in these patients, uh, which account for about 20%, but a lot of it is actually burned in the Krebs cycle, in heart, in brain, in muscles. And uh, one of the mechanisms that the, uh, that the patients use is they actually are able to increase the amount of, of uh, lactate that is being oxidized because the delivery to the gluconeogenic organs, kidney and liver is reduced. So, you know, when we talked about the, the, the first study by uh, Jones, uh, whether we should use lactate clearance, centrovenous oxygen, and there was a reply by Emmanuel Rivers um, to this article and said, oh, yes, of course we should measure both um, because, you know, it means that if you produce lactate, you don't have enough oxygen. And it may, if you measure the SVO2, you can then decide whether it's the oxygen problem or not oxygen problem. But it's really not as simple as that. And what we have to realize is that the lactate shuttle is broken in critical illness for both increased production and, incre and reduced disposal because of the splunking basic constriction. And so we have to realize the lactate shuttle is broken and we need to restore that. Uh, but uh, how do we do it? Well, the firefighters, when the lactate, when the shuttle is broken, they might want to put a, pull a, uh, put a lot of water on it, and that's not a good idea on a burning shuttle because it can explode. So, uh, if we were to use lactate clearance in fluid therapy, uh, we know it's a prognostic factor, excellent prognostic factor, and it's an excellent warning sign that there's something wrong happening with the patients that the shuttle is broken. Um, and, you know, if this profound tissue hypoperfusion was we said, yes, it'll be increased and it will indicate that if it's severe hypovolemia or severe shock, we have splanking vasoconstriction and so lactate will be very high. So it's good all for that, but it's not so specific for tissue hypoperfusion as we discussed and doesn't really real time um, because we don't do the measurements real time, at least not now, although some devices uh, might are being made for continuous lactate measurement. It's somewhat available and somewhat simple as, you know, but as we said, there's a lot of issues with it and it doesn't recover so far. So maybe we should use peripheral perfusion as our guide to fluid therapy, not lactate, because it's much more available, much simpler and much faster to react to, um, uh, to therapy. So surviving sepsis guideline 2021, give us a bit of an option well, we should maybe suggesting that we should maybe uh, use uh, uh, decrease of serum lactate in patients if it's elevated to guide us with fluid resuscitation, uh, or we should use capillary refill time. And I will argue that we shouldn't use the um, lactate clearance. Of course, it's nice if the lactate is being reduced. It's fine. It's a problem if it's not, but we should really guide our fluid balance uh, our fluid therapy because of that. And the reason is that we tend to give if, and this was an Andromeda shock trial in Latin America, and they nice, beautifully demonstrated that if you guide res fluid resuscitation uh, by lactate, you actually end up giving more fluid and uh, you have more organ dysfunction. And in somehow we even have a higher lactate level in these patients, where, uh, as opposed to using just a couple of refill time. And they also were able to show, and we can discuss that about the validity of this, and that, but they did show that uh, mortality was uh, reduced uh, when you use uh, peripheral perfusion-guided resuscitation uh, as opposed to lactate-guided resuscitation. And it may be related to the fact that actually giving less fluid is probably more beneficial to our patients. Uh, as we, you know, we can see in these um, trials that have been shown acute pancreatitis, if you give less fluid, it's probably better. Um, and um, if you give early restrictive or liberal, it doesn't make a huge difference. 
and then we restrict intravenous fluid in ICU patients with septic shock. Overall, it doesn't make a huge difference, um, but it does make a difference in patients with lung injury mainly, patients who required uh, intubation, uh, really benefited from less fluid given the opposite was for patients who had uh, who didn't require intubation, mostly with abdominal sepsis. Although none of those reached statistical significance, so it's just hypertensis generating. But you can see that even with patients with plasma lactate more than four, the restrictive fluid uh, had somewhat better result than if the lactate was lower. So again, there's a disconnect about the amount of fluid given and lactate. So we shouldn't really target lactate. So in conclusion, uh, you know, increased lactate production in our patients, mainly due to adrenergic stress, inflammation, maybe due to cancer, drugs, uh, thiamine deficiency, and really the hypoxia ischemia is less important. It may be that the ischemia, the inability to move lactate from tissues into the uh, organs that can metabolize it. Um, in, so you, you you have problem with the shuttle that uh, that is that may be a problem, but uh, really the the reasons for the increased productions are rarely hypoxia per se. Uh, we also know that we discussed that about the reduced plugging and renal blood flow, and there's some variable uptake and metabolism of lactate in liver and kidney, depending on whether the patient has got liver injury, kidney injury. You know, venous back pressure often causes problems with liver and kidney perfusion. Um, and again, fluid therapy might increase the venous congestion of these organs. But overall, the metabolism is not that different as we've demonstrated or shown in the, um, as it was shown in the um, study of cardiogenic shock patients. And of course, that all leads to increased blood lactate level. But if we act on the raised blood, blood lactate level, we do need to act on it because of course something's happening, but we shouldn't guide our resuscitation uh, based on lactate clearance or lactate level. We should use modeling score or couple of refill time uh, to reduce hypovolemia uh, if it's present that may respond to fluid. And that will also reduce, once we correct hypovolemia, that will reduce adrenergic stress and therefore lead to less lactate being produced. So um, that would be my, uh, my suggestion to you that targeting normal lactate level or lactate clearance results in over resuscitation, giving too much fluid and potentially harmful use of inotropes and intravenous fluid. And with that, I'd like to thank you. And I'd like to also thank you, my uh, early mentor, who unfortunately is not alive anymore, um, uh, who died uh, years and years ago, who was a champion of the lactate uh, story in critical illness, Professor Xavier Leverve. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, uh, Dr. Dallas, for this uh, wonderful overview of, of the lactate and its role, uh, whether it's production or clearance, and uh, correcting some of the misconception uh, that, that a lot of people have. Um, I can tell you how many times I round in the morning and I see patient got fluid. Why the patient got fluid? Because the lactate went up. That's the answer that we often get. Uh, why the yes. lactate went up? And often uh, blood pressure didn't change. Nothing has changed other than the lactate went up. So uh, I really hope um, this lecture um, will be uh, seen and, uh, and listened to by uh, new fellows were starting in 72 hours from now uh, with the new academic year starting in, on July 1st. Uh, it's really wonderful to view. And I do remember uh, Professor uh, Dever uh, lecture on that um, when, when, we, when we met in person uh, in Bali many, many years ago. Uh, it was always uh, fascinating to understand the lactate the right way. Um, and, and thank you for going over that quick summary. Um, I have two questions. One is, if lactate is innocent bystander, although it's not innocent, um, why the mortality is high? I, I think you, you answered that. I just want to reiterate about the inflammatory process and, and reinforce your message about trying to correct it, whether this is the this is something that we need to understand. It's a, it's a poor prognostic sign, but you won't be able to correct it. So I just want to hear you. Yeah. Re, re, I think you, 
you you are absolutely correct and often um, again you know people seem to concentrate a lot on lactate or oh, lactate's high sure you have to think about the lactate being high but you need to think about why what is the problem and go and find out why what is the problem for the patient but don't treat the lactate as such treat the condition that led to it you know if you have a patient with pericardial tamponade uh, lactate will go high should you give fluid? Well, maybe it will initially co correct a low pressure tamponade to, but it will only work for a little while. In fact, you're causing a lot more venous congestion by giving the fluid uh, and you need to drain the fluid. Once you drain the fluid, you restore, you restore uh, the, the forward blood pressure and you reduce the venous back pressure and so you improve flow. And that will get, you know, like they will be moved from one organ to the other and the organs won't be congested, so they'll metabolize it easily. But that's what we need to, correct, you know, concentrate on. It's similar to, um, you know, you said your residents uh, like they've gone up, they give fluid. Uh, so the second most common one is, oh, the urine output was low, so I gave fluid. But we know that actually in acute kidney injury, the more fluid you give, the worse the kidney injury gets. The only re the only uh, correct time when we uh, when urine output responds to fluid is when there is overt hypovolemia, and this is a similar situation. So we should not treat uh, lactate or or uh, low urine output with fluids. We should treat the reason for it. And yes, sometimes it may be fluids because the patient may be hypovolemic. They have diarrhea, loss in the out drains out, um, of course, but not all the time. Uh, thank you. Um, I want to give opportunity for others to ask questions, but I have a second question I'll ask later. Any other questions from the uh, audience, please? Don't be shy. All right. I'll far ask... away, I can't bite you, so. <laughs> <laughs> You're very far away. Um, the, um, the study by Dr. Levy with the norepinephrine versus epinephrine in cardiogenic shock after MI, um, I found it interesting, and you touched quickly on it as well. Um, the outcome was um, higher refractory shock uh, by using epinephrine. It's, um, it's a more adrenergic, more stimulation of alpha and beta receptors. Um, do you think the lactate here had an impact on that, uh, being in the refractory shock? Yes, I, I don't think the lactate, as, uh, sorry, the adrenaline as such had an effect on, we know that in septic shock, uh, it is probably better to give noradrenaline, but the, adre the study uh, that was done in Australia comparing noradrenaline and adrenaline in septic shock patients, and that was a blinded study, didn't show any difference uh, in outcome. So, so yes, there are some reasons because adrenaline has, has this better stimulating effect on metabolism it um it may may not be as good and noradrenaline which doesn't have this metabolic effect uh may be better so uh you know if if we don't need to use the uh, the glycolysis and and the shuttle if we don't need to use it naturally why would you stimulate it that may not be a good thing because the body's already doing what what it's supposed to do most of the time so so maybe that that is the reason, but there's not a huge effect, at least not in the doses that we seem to use uh, in septic shock patients. Uh, if probably the outcome is worse in um, in epinephrine was primarily maybe the oxygen consumption is higher when you use higher doses of beta stimulation by using the epinephrine compared to norepinephrine. That's one of the hypotheses in the paper, and that's uh, that that is possible. Well, you know, it, it's possible. And again, you're stimulating lactate production. And so you essentially forcing other organs like the, you know, it may be good for the heart, but it may not be so good for the kidney and the liver because they are already overwhelmed. And now you, you, you're giving them more lactate to, you know, form glucose in the gluconergine express, which is actually quite ATP uh, consuming. So it uses a lot of energy. It's an energy uh, uh, requiring process, gluconeogenesis. So 
you know, if your organs already stressed for energy and you force it to use more energy for something that they don't need, uh, it's probably not very good. Yeah, we used to switch with cardiogenic shock patient on when we see contractility on echo is poor. And even in septic patients, we switch from norepinephrine to epinephrine. Now, after this evidence, we stop doing that, at least uh, in my area. Uh, so yes, I agree. Mm -hmm. Uh, any other questions for uh, Dr. Nels? Sorry, it's Dr. Leibner. So my question is, I know you talked a lot about kind of you not guiding based on lactate clearance and fluid resuscitation as opposed to using kind of capillary refill and signs of uh, other signs. What are, Do you find ultrasound is helpful? And I know you were talking about the kind of venous congestion. Do you use ultrasound to look at kind of venous congestion and liver congestion as, met, uh, as ways to kind of control and figure out how much fluid patients need, or what do you find is the most helpful way to kind of determine that? Yes, I, that's a very good question. Yes, I, I, you know, I'm an ultrasound enthusiast and, uh, and um, definitely, so, so why lactate is high? Okay, why is it high? The first thing is I need to know about the heart. Uh, you know, is it pumping enough blood around? Is it working? Is, uh, is, uh, do I have venous congestion? So is the right side dilated? Or is my IVC dilated? Is, is you know is the backflow into the hepatic vein that I can see on uh, hepatic vein Doppler ultrasound? And uh, or is a problem with forward flow? You know what's the ejection fraction? Um, you know do I have a valve problem? So definitely uh, ultrasound is there in terms of guiding fluid resuscitation. Uh, I'll be again a bit controversial. I love CVP, and you know why? It's not so much. Uh, to target certain CVP 8 to 12 or whatever. It's I want to use the lowest CVP that the heart allows me to pump blood around. So that way you reduce any venous congestion, you maintain the flow. Uh, and, and so that's, it gives you enough to keep the flow forward. So you can monitor your cardiac output by uh, whatever method you want, whether it's VTI with echo again, or whether you do it, um, you know, pulse contour analysis, and then you try to keep the CVP as low as possible that gives you the cardiac output that satisfies the tissues. Um, so in terms of fluid overload, you know, you can ultrasound the lung. If, if you see, uh, if you didn't have uh, B lines on lung ultrasound and you, you do fluid resuscitation, patient starts to have B lines, you've probably overdone it, but B lines are probably a bit too sensitive because everyone lying flat will have some degree of B lines, at least uh, in the dependent parts of the lung. Um, so, but definitely ultrasound use, IVC size, uh, collapsibility, the, the um, uh, Doppler profile of the hepatic, uh, hepatic vein flow is very informative. And of course, very informative for diagnosing what the problem is if the patient needs fluid. Thank you. That was very helpful. I, I work in a cardiac unit, so we love our swans, but um, sure. uh, the ultrasound, I think, is kind of the next best thing for most of these patients. So that was great. Thank you. Thank you. Um, does anyone else have any other questions? I know that a lot of the Mickey people, Sam, anyone else um, want to ask a question before we jump off? Okay. If, um, if there's no other questions, thank you so much again for giving us this wonderful lecture. I know we all really appreciate it. And um, we're going to let everyone go for a few minutes early so that everyone can get to PSQ. Fantastic. Thank you so much for in inviting me. I really appreciate that. It was a great pleasure and honor to be able to present to you. And uh, I hope we, we'll see you in person sometime soon. Thank yeah. you very much. Sounds great. Thank you so much.